Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, it's been about 20 years since I've done any uh, public speaking. I used to, uh, in Yakima, I'll go to the uh, local jail and do a church service. And um, I did that for about three years. And I, at first, I was very nervous talking in front of people. And as time went on, I got very, you know, pretty good, I thought. And I mentioned to one of the other pastors, I said, I think I got the hang of this. And he said to me, uh, you know, Mike, they can't leave. So, uh, so if I'm a little nervous, bear with me because it's been a while, but we'll get through this. Um, I work out at Hanford, and what I do is um, I'm an instrument tech or an industrial automation technician. And what I do is work on unique instruments that monitor these tanks uh, for temperature, pH levels, uh, for uh, detect leaks. Um, fortunately, I grew up in Yakima where they, they teach this. Uh, I went to school at Perry Tech in Yakima. It's one of about three schools that teaches instrumentation. So fortunately, we have that school real close to Hanford because we have about 75 instrument techs out there on staff. And our job is very important because we're the ones that keep track of all this waste. It's our job to keep track of every small drop so it doesn't escape. Um, about a year and a half ago, maybe almost two years, uh, one of my instruments detected a, a problem on one of the double shell tanks. And I was responsible for, to uh, go out there and look at this instrument to, to see if it was working right. And what, to my surprise, I found that uh, it was. And um, the equipment had detected a leak in one of our double shell tanks, something we thought would never happen. And then I went through about a year's struggle with management to convince them that it was actually leaking. They didn't want to uh, deal with the problem at the time. They had other issues. And so I'm going to get a minute to set up some more props here, but uh, Meredith is going to play a little video from one of the interviews I did with King 5, kind of lead you into what I'm talking about. And it'll kind of show you the stress I went under um, last year at work, and then I'll talk a little bit more in a minute. This is one spot at Hanford the public is never allowed to go. Underfoot, the most hazardous material on earth is brewing inside a million gallon double shell tank. This tank is, a, is holding the nastiest of nasty stuff at Hanford. A year and a half ago, Mike Geffrey, who works for a Hanford contractor, saw what no one expected. Evidence that tank was leaking. If so, it would be the first double shell tank to ever leak at the site. I knew it was serious because that's what my career has been for the last 25 years, is to monitor these tanks, to check for leaks. I mean, that's been what I've done. Geffrey reported his findings to the top company guy in the field right away, WRPS manager Dave Strasser, who argued this wasn't serious, that rainwater, not nuclear waste, must have creeped into the space between the tank's inner and outer shells. It was kind of just, we don't want to deal with it, Mike, you know, just let it go. Shut up. Just shut up, just let it go. Yeah, just don't worry about it. But Geffrey did worry about it as warning after warning rolled in. A leak detection alarm went off. A few weeks later, an air monitor spiked to the highest reading of radioactivity ever seen by current employees. Five months after that, equipment got stuck to the tank floor, an indicator it was glued to sticky waste. I complained a lot about it. You know, I made a lot of statements of what, what are we going to do? After all that, the employees here at Hanford came across the biggest red flag of all, something the experts say should have sent their managers scrambling to find answers. A broken wire, similar to this one behind the glass, was pulled out of the space between the shells. It gave off an extremely hot radiation reading, one that shocked the workers, but not the managers. They didn't call for more investigation. Instead, they kept to their rainwater theory. It's hard to believe that you could get this much advanced warning of a problem and not deal with it. Marco Kaltofen is a top radiation expert located in Massachusetts. He's been to Hanford many times. I really don't know what it's going to take. What is it going to take to get you to wake up and start dealing with a problem? Because problems do not fix themselves, and they definitely don't fix themselves in Hanford. 
WRPS, the contractor hired by the feds to take care of all the tanks at Hanford, denied repeated requests for an on-camera interview, but they told us their experts disagree. They said contamination readings were well below what would have been expected from tank waste and that the alleged red flags were investigated and determined unlikely to be caused by a leak. Months went by. Yeah. And what happened? Well, nothing. Jeffrey says his WRPS bosses told him to conduct business as usual, but that didn't happen. Yeah, I'd come home and be just frustrated and grumpy, couldn't sleep at nights. He even considered ditching his long and successful career. They took the fun out of it. This company took the fun out of my job. Just was, just didn't enjoy it anymore. You know, it's hard to go to work and to fight so hard to do the right thing. But Geoffrey stayed on the job and was there to see this. Photos of not rainwater, but nuclear sludge oozing into the space. The pictures were taken during a routine inspection nearly a year after managers dismissed his first warnings. What I was doing was right, you know. And it validated that um, I was doing the right thing by calibrating the stuff and sticking with it, and that it actually worked and it detected the leak, and, and there was a leak there. I gotta admit, that's hard to watch. Um, for a year, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, it's still hard to watch because for a year I worked very hard to do my job. And until Susanna I had talked, I hadn't talked with anybody about what had happened. I had kept it all inside. And um, it was a tough year for me because I have a vested... <clears throat> I have a vested in interest at Hanford because I spend a lot of my free time on the Columbia River. I fish, I hunt there, I take, <clears throat> I take my family boating there. <clears throat> Gosh, still hard, still hard to think about it. Um, so to go through, I went through for a year trying to get my company to believe in what we were doing and that we had a problem was hard. And it's hard to watch that because I just kind of held all that in for a long time. And through the interviews we did with King Five, it finally came out, and I was able to talk about it. And it really, you know, it still bothers me to think <clears throat> that I was that miserable at work trying to just do my job. I mean, nobody should go to work and try to work that hard to do the right thing. You should be able to go to work and just do what's right and, and be rewarded for that. And I wasn't being rewarded for doing my job. And I, I know I make a good living getting paid for what I do, but that, there's more to it than that. There's more to it than just getting paid. I want, uh, I want to be clean out there. I want to go boating on the Columbia River, not worry about running after material, being on the banks, or, uh, or going fishing and worrying about the fish I catch. I've got some kind of nucleides in them. I don't want that to happen. I mean, so to me, there's, I have a lot vested in out there, a lot more than I think than the companies I work for. A lot of our management comes from the East Coast or elsewhere, and they're going to make their money, make their profits, and they're going to go back to their places where they live, and they're going to enjoy their luxurious life and their retirement. I'm still going to be out there. I'm going to still be in, in Yakima. I'm still going to go fishing. And I don't want that place to be a mess. I don't want my kids to have to deal with it. I don't want my grandkids to have to deal with it. You know, my grandfather's generation created this mess. I mean, or made the decisions to do what they did. I had nothing to do with it. So I'm just out there responsible for trying to clean it up. Well, sad to say that if we get the vet plant running, it'll be another 40 years before we're done making glass logs out of the waste. So that means your children or grandchildren will be cleaning up that mess. I won't be around here in 2062. And we'll be six generations removed, still trying to clean up it was something we did in the 40s. Um, it, was, it was done for a very good reason then, but we still right now have the responsibility to get it cleaned up. So that was a little longer than I wanted to do, and I had a little 
demonstration I wanted to show you that's a little on the lighter side. So I'm going to go with that. Maybe I won't be so emotionally choked up here. So. So a lot of you may ask, how did we get in this mess in the first place? Well, I want to kind of explain to you real quick how it works. This is Mike Jeffrey's two-minute chemistry class, okay? So what we got here is at the nuclear reactors, we took uranium-238, I think 238, something naturally in the ground, in the earth, and we took this uranium and made composite it together. Through fission, we uh, created other nuclear elements. So what we, what we got here, this is your fuel rod that came from the reactors. And they actually were about this size, and they had uranium pellets inside of them. And after 90 days of being in the reactor, in a close group, the atoms split themselves and made new atoms. So you take these fuel rods and you put them together like this in the, in the reactor core. Neutrons shoot at each other, split another neutrons. We take uranium and we make plutonium and uranium-240, okay? The things we use for plutonium bombs. The problem with this is only 3% of the elements are usable. The other 97% are the nuclear elements that we don't want, strontium, cesium, iodine, that have no purpose for us. Those are the elements that we're dealing with now. So imagine, this, this here's our tank, you know, and this is holding our nuclear waste. This little shot glass would be how much we used in, in weapons production. And in reality, it would be this shot glass and like a 15-gallon keg in, in equivalence between what we used and what we made as waste. So if you take this stuff after you dissolve the fuel rods, it almost looks like Mountain Dew. It's actually green. This, this simulates my double shot. So there's what you had. After we took our fuel rods and we dissolved them, we came up with a shot glass of usable plutonium. And what we else we had was about 53 million gallons of nuclear waste, something that was the byproduct of making our nuclear bombs. So what my job has been for the last 26 years is to watch that nuclear waste and take care of it. So this has been my baby for 26 years my glass of Mountain Dew. And uh, I measure it, I watch it, um, I test it, you know, and, and for 26 years, that's what I've been doing, day in and day out. And it sounds kind of boring as at times it is. I've calibrated a piece of equipment that monitors stuff probably thousands of times. Uh, a temperature monitor that monitors the temperature I've calibrated it hundreds of thousands of times. And all, always, we're always looking for positive things, negative, nothing negative, because nothing negative is ever supposed to happen out of Hanford. But when something does, things, things go a little strange on us. And that's the case that happened for me. In 2011, I went out to calibrate a piece of equipment that they told me had quit working over the weekend. It was a device that, that actually sits around the tank and it just monitors for stuff to leak out. And this equipment we calibrate once a month to make sure it's operating right. They came, I came in Monday, they told me, hey Mike, this, you know, our NRAF is not working right. And I said, well, why isn't it working right? They said, well, it's measuring something. So, as an instrument tech, we're always trained, believe your equipment. So I get an, always a debate, well, maybe we have a problem. No, nah, we never have problems out here. It can't be a problem. So they send me out, 
to look at my equipment. I go out and I take my computer and it's a Monday morning, you know, I've had a nice weekend. Get out there with my computer, I hook it up, and I have a health physic technician with me. A real nice lady, her and I have worked together a long time. And we'll just call her Jan. So we get out there, it's Monday, I hook up my computer, start punching my numbers. Start looking and I went, oh. I said, Jan, everything's working. She, she kind of looks at me, really? I said, yeah, it's, it's working. And it shows we got a half inch of leaking fluid in the annulus. So out there, everything's redundant. You don't believe one thing once, you don't believe two things twice. So the first problem I had was the instrument looked like it was working good. The second check I made looked like it was calibrated. So we go, let's do a third check. So what we do, this instrument has um, a wire holding a plummet going down to the bottom of the annulus space. And we're going to raise it, look for radiation. I think in 26 years, I've probably done this easily 10,000 times with the same results. So again, here we go again, computer's on. And Jan has a Geiger meter. It's a little instrument you probably learned about it that detects radiation. And they set it down on the ground. And in theory, if something comes up contaminated, it's supposed to start popping, making popping noise. So Jan's got it sitting there. We're waiting, talking about our weekend. It takes about five minutes for this thing to come up. And all of a sudden, pop, 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 pop. I look down. Jan and I look at each other. I go, do you hear that? She goes, yeah, I do. As it comes up, the popping gets louder. Now, out of work, when you hear that, that's a bad thing. Okay. When the pops get faster and closer together and louder, that means we've got some contamination problems. So Jen and I look at each other, and it gets louder. The instrument goes off scale. Holy cow. We got a serious problem. I think my eyes were about this big. <laughs> we're looking at each other. And Jen's been there about five years. And she says, Mike, have you ever seen this? And I said, nope, not, not ever. As the instrument came up, when we looked in, we can, there's a sight glass we can look at. The radiation readings were so high, the GM doesn't work anymore. And we carry this other thing out with what's called an RO20. The RO20 measures what kind of dose rates your body's receiving. And anything that reads on this scale is not good. So Jan puts it up there. She starts adjusting the dial. And I'm watching. One, two, three. I'm, I'm stepping back. Jan's holding the instrument out. She says, wow, it's reading 5MR. I said, holy crap. You know, and I looked at her, I said, Jan, we got a leaking tank. I mean, it was almost surreal. Thousands of times I've done this, and bam, there it is. I mean, I didn't want to get, I mean, it's not something to get excited about, but it's going, holy cow, this stuff actually works. You know, all these calibrations, all this stuff, and now it's working. So I get on the radio, call the manager, and said, hey, we've got a serious problem out here. I think we've got a leaking tank. Now, saying those words, leaking tank, at Hanford is like saying bomb on an airplane or fire in a movie theater, but you do it really calmly. I mean, you're calm on the radio because there's 10,000 people listening to you. We got a leaking tank, I think. The manager comes across, uh, you better come on in. So I did, I went into the offices and I showed them what I had, explained it to them. And the dose of reality, I don't think really sunk into them that we had a problem, but we really did. I think I've got two minutes. It's like the Academy Awards, you know. The music starts playing, you gotta get going. So, okay, so we'll make a short story. A, a, long, a little shorten it up here. So anyhow, long story short, I spent the next 10 months trying to convince management that we had a problem, that we had a tank, our first double shell tank that was leaking, a bad indicator because these tanks are supposed to store this waste until we're done processing it, which could be 2062. We're not close to that. 
These tanks were meant to last 50 years. This one is 50 years old. I think it just celebrated its birthday not too long ago. So what's our next step? Unfortunately, um, my management and the government doesn't have a next step. That worries me. You know, in this business, when you find a leak, find a problem, time is not on your side. You gotta get going. Unfortunately, we wasted a year debating whether we had a leak or not. In, in 2012, August, they came out officially and said we were, our tank was leaking. We were one year too late. Had we started a year earlier, we could be a year ahead of where we should be. But sometimes, you know, out of Hanford, bad news is not a good thing. And, you know, it's nothing we all want to hear, but it's the, you know, it's what we got to face. So, I, I think I'm, my time's up. I could speak for hours. You know, Hanford's my passion. It's been my life for 26 years. And um, I hope that you can get involved and become more interested. In, we need a lot of smart, young, bright people like you out there, out there working in Hanford. So thank you.